Hello everyone, I'm John McCullough, I'm the publisher of PositiveLight.com and we're here today in the studio of Ray Helkio. Hi Ray. Hi John. Um, Ray is, um, is a Toronto graphic designer and Ray you have um, recently designed some publicity posters for PositiveLight.com mm -hmm. which are I love. So could you tell me a little bit about the creative concept, how you came up with the ideas of the posters? Sure. I, like all good projects, I think this one came from both conversations with you um, and Brian Finch at Positive Light. Um, for me, it was a really exciting project because what I look for in good projects is a, a client that has a singular message and knows their audience and knows what they have of value that's different. And I think with this, after a couple of emails and a few conversations, I was really clear that uh, um, what Positive Light is, is offering something uniquely different that's not in the marketplace and that you guys were clear on that. Right. And so going back and forth, getting some feedback was consistently, oh, you know, honing in on our message rather than adding to. So for me, it ended up being a very lovely, easy project to work on. Excellent. Well, it's certainly they're exciting posters and I'm glad you worked on them for us. Um, so Ray, you're a graphic designer. Um, what, what made you get into that field as a career? The short answer is I got kicked out of my house. Um, my parents kicked me out, or my mom did, when I was 16. And so I had been deciding on all kinds of career options, mostly driven by money and how I was going to make a living. And so at 16, I said, you know what? I've got no place to live. I don't have, no one's paying for my school. So it doesn't matter. I'll do what I want. And I decided to go to Ontario College of Art and Design. Sort of the back end of that was also community college at the time seemed like a cheaper alternative, certainly cheaper than university. <laughs> I got accepted to OCA and then quickly found out that it's more expensive than most universities. Mm -hmm. Still, you know, the best decision I ever made, but that was what, why, why I ended up in graphic design. Yeah. And now, now you have your own company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what kind of work are you doing at the moment? Besides when you're not working for us, what are you, what are you doing? Well, similar work. So I, all my clients, 95% of them are charities. So they're either ASOs or in the LGBTQ community. ASOs meaning AIDS service organizations. Exactly, yeah. Or they're in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or questioning community. Um, and I've kept it that way because I worked in regular advertising for a long time in, at agencies, and I loved it. But I'd get four or five different projects, and that's it for ever ad nauseum. And so this is great because I get to work with clients who want to do something, want to make some change for the most part, and really have a really good sense for where they want to go. And they don't have a huge budget. So right. it makes it easy for me to come in and say, okay, well, let's, you know, compromise and see what we can do here. I get great creative, they get some great stuff, they don't have to spend a fortune, and it's, uh, we get to do some good work. That's wonderful. Um, now, um, a lot of your clients have been um, organizations in the HIV sector. Um, what particularly, other than what you've just mentioned, what particularly has drawn you to working for that community? Uh, well, for me, I used to work uh, at an ASO. I worked for the Toronto People with AIDS Foundation for like six years as the director of development. Um, and that was a, you know, a unique experience for me. And just leaving that, people already knew my work and some of the stuff that I did. So I remained in that field. And then later when I zero converted, I think HIV took on a slightly different meaning for me. I, I uh, like I was saying to you earlier, I, I don't know that HIV is ever given me like a qualification to sort of have better insights but certainly it's given me a better appreciation for my own life and what's important right. so you know the kind of clients I end up working with generally need to be aligned with the stuff that I want to do it's it's a little bit about not wasting time here but also more about valuing the time that I have in a way that I never really did before I, I think I held on to that belief when I was 12 that I would live forever and uh, you know well, I still want to believe that that's true. I really get that the time to live is now and it's not right. later. Right. So um, we all have our own HIV stories and uh, your one is interesting um, in that you worked for an ASO, um, uh, worked in HIV prevention, but it was only after you stopped doing that work that you yourself sort of converted. So you said I could ask you about that. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. So could you tell us that story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not that I didn't listen to the messages. I mean, I'm certainly one of the people that were helping to create the messaging. Um, I was aware of all the risks. And so for me, it was a blow job. Um, and I had a sore throat. And it's a low risk activity turned into a high risk activity. Um, for me, it was never a, a blaming moment or, oh, look what happened. It was, this is what happened, and I really needed to accept that piece of information. So what was devastating to me when I got my diagnosis was, 
you know, you've got 180, my white blood cell count was 180. So, you know, the definition of that was AIDS. And so they said, you know, you're going to have to take meds and these meds will probably kill you before they make you better. That oh for me was oh the God. moment where I was like, wow, this really is a whole different world that I'm having to sort of grapple with. And it's not that I grappled with that right away. It took me about six months, still working in advertising, plugging away every day with partial pneumonia, trying to just get get it through and figure out, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Because suddenly, you know, I went from I'm going to live forever to it might be months, it might be a year at best. And that kind of information could had the potential to completely cripple me. And it certainly does. It has some of my friends. Um, but in this case, it really empowered me. I think I was mentioning to you, you know, not that I take HIV lightly and I'd like to not have it. However, it has been the greatest gift that I've ever had. Mostly because, you know, had I not gotten HIV, there would have been no sort of moment that I would have sort of stopped and said, questioned how I was living my life. You know, smoking cigarettes, going to fly every weekend and drinking the way I was. Something needed to give. And frankly, if I hadn't had that little tap from the universe saying, this is your moment to wake up, I wouldn't have woken up. And frankly, you know, HIV was the thing that saved my life because without that, I just would have continued on the route that I was. And I was the last person to believe that there was something, yeah, something wrong. It's very interesting how many people actually do say that HIV has changed their lives for the best. And in fact, I think one of the posters you've uh, designed for us, more or less, gives, gives that message too about. Well, HIV is part of a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, I, I really like, and that's one of the reasons when I was talking to you guys originally and Brian, that I really love where you guys were going with this because um, often HIV is seen as something dirty and tainted. And certainly I even, even felt that way when I was first diagnosed. And I really get that it can be something really wonderful. I mean, I, I lost a really good friend of mine who had cancer and I don't believe he ever got the gift that, you know what, this is something you have an opportunity here. I had an opportunity to change my life and do something great or just take it and go down with the Titanic. And I, I chose the latter. And, and fortunately, I was lucky. I've got some great doctors who are involved in HIV research. And so they were really, uh, the advice I got and the um, companionship I got was a lot more um, solid than I think a lot of people who are not in urban cities um, are, you know, get. So right. I feel very fortunate for that. I take it your health is good now. It's been six years and I believe firmly in my mind over matter. I've always believed this. and. Uh, I did an emphoresis test, which is trying to find some HIV in my system, and they haven't been able to find any for six years. And so I've remained undetectable, which is like a mini miracle. Um, but it was also what I had said when I worked at PWA. I always had seen there was volunteers, clients, staff members who were positive, and I recognized that some people had something. I didn't know whether it was religion or what it was that made them like just, I don't know, glow and seem better with HIV, and some just seemed to have HIV like a monkey on their back. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I ever seroconverted or got cancer or something really, you know, that's threatening my life, that I would look at it in a way that some of my other friends did. Um, and some of those people like were really models to me when I tested positive, I thought, I've got one of two options. I can really kick and scream, which it had been my whole life up to that point, or I can sit back and relax and go, this is it. And how do I want to change as a result of it? And I make it sound very simple, but that was like a real six month process with a lot of therapy trying to get to a place where I felt like, you know, HIV is just something I have as opposed to this is the all of me. So that's a really inspiring story, uh, Ray. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing that with us. And indeed, thank you for the wonderful posters that you've designed for us. They're going to be very spectacularly um, appreciated, I'm sure. So uh, my you. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm John McCullough from PositiveLight.com.